when I originally read the name of this chapter, I had no idea what they meant. Um, but when you look at the learning objectives, it makes it really cl clear. So um, essentially, this chapter is about two methods for finding um, the optimal number of predictors. Um, and both of these methods essentially help you avoid finding a local optimum point and look and like allow you to look at the entire global space of, of combinations in an efficient way. Um, and those two algorithms are um, genetic algorithms and then this new one that I had never heard of called simulated annealing. Um, yeah. The first part of it though, um, so in conjunction to these two methods, they use um, a naive Bayes classification model. Um, and we're looking at the OkCupid okay data again, right? And so um, we're trying to predict whether someone is STEM or non-STEM based on things uh, included in their OkCupid okay profile. Um, so I actually don't use Bayes that much in my own work. So this review was really helpful for me in terms of like understanding what goes into a naive Bayes model. Um, and essentially, I think there there's two variables that they really use for this, and that is um, religion in the profile, a categorical feature, and then um, like number of words in their profile, not number of words. I think it's like number of punctuation points, actually, but we can get to that later. Um, and so essentially what they do is for, for categorical features, you're computing a, a joint likelihood of, um, you know, the probability of being STEM given that somebody is um, agnostic or Christian. Right, and um, they create uh, like this table essentially, and then they you can kind of compare with several graphs. They did binning here to show you the distribution between um, non-stem, stem. Um, just looking at um, the two groups with a density plot. We can see that, in fact, what, which one is the blue? Um, STEM profiles had slightly more punctuation points than non-STEM. Hey, Ethan. So yeah. I, I don't know if you're sharing something different than what we're seeing, but I can see the our studio window. Oh. And maybe oh. Slack behind it. I don't okay. think whatever graph you're talking about. There we go. All righty. Uh, you, <laughs> you, you were talking an awful lot, and I thought, Maybe okay. there's more, but maybe he's just warming up. I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. Carry, yes. Carry on. Both sir. of those things. Um, so here, here's the essentially like the cross tabulation I was talking about, right? Where we're, we're showing, you know, non-stem stem. And then here's the density plot um, where we're looking at the number of um, punctuation marks and comparing the density between stem and non-stem. You see there's like this, this, this gap essentially um stem people i guess uh maybe write more sentences i'm i'm not quite sure this is again a very simple model right really like only long, two longer people. sentences maybe where you require punctuation yeah yeah maybe so maybe not in stem people are a little more long-winded i'm not sure um and then, so the basic things that go into uh, the naive Bayes model are this. So your two predictors, religion, um, punctuation, which is like number of punctuation marks, um, the likelihood of it occurring, um, the prior, which I believe this has to do, I could be wrong, that has to do with the, the prior distribution um, of the data. And then the posterior is cal um, calculated by um, multiplying the prior and the likelihood um, of their normalized values and like summing them together. So the major drawbacks of this is that of, of naive Bayes in particular is that it assumes that your 
predictors are predictors or samples. I'm not quite sure. Probably both. Um, that your predictors are independent of each other, which clearly this is not often the case. If you have a large enough um, data set, that's not really a problem. Um, also, um, like if you have a, a high number of predictors, that's a huge issue, right? And so that's where um, the global search methods come in is because we want a more uh, parsimonious model that's, that's simpler and gets rid of irrelevant features that would bias our, our naive based model, essentially. So the first method they talk about, and I realize there's a lot of notes here. Um, I had I had only briefly seen this like like used before, so I really had to read quite uh, a bit of it. I had heard of genetic algorithms and have been using them, um, but essentially, essentially, what annealing is is annealing is the process in smithing where you heat up a material or metal and that rearranges the chem or the the chemicals like the ions in your metal whether that's ion um iron or sulfur or whatever it rearranges them so that they're stronger and so that's kind of the analogy we use for simulated annealing um instead of um let me turn this off instead of um like iron or some sort of material we're talking about um, the predictor space. So the predictors are the material. And when you heat that material, um, you're mixing up the predictors um, to try and get a stronger um, or more predictive result in the end. And so, um, Let's see, to do that, there's like this very simple formula where um, you look at the combinations of predictors before annealing um, and you compare it to the new configuration. And then you have some sort of threshold where if you accept the new configuration of predictors as good or not. And based off of that, you um, repeat the process. And there's this really long, um, kind of like step-by-step step that I'll, I'll go through. This was certainly, I feel like, the more difficult one to understand, and there's probably more that goes into simulated annealing than um, genetic algorithms. Um, but I think overall, uh, it's, it's like a step process. You're like gradually, you know, increasing... Um, the accuracy based on whichever are the appropriate predictors. Um, in addition, like one of the things that um, is part of this acceptance formula is after each generation, um, your threshold for accepting a value as good um, decreases. And so I believe this is done to reduce overfitting and um, to ensure that you don't get stuck in a local optimal point. Because, um, right, if you're just like always increase, always, um, you know, showing an increase of accuracy, but it's not by that much, you could be stuck in like a predictor space that is not actually the optimal space. So that's why they have this like penalty term in there, which I believe is this C right here is, is like, I think it's the penalty. And then the I is like your iteration. So like through, through, through time or through the iterations, the, your, your penalty increases. Um, and so this is just like a step-by-step -step, um, how the feature selection works. So you create an initial, an initial random subset of the features, and then you specify the number of iterations. And then so for each iteration, um, the feature subsets are, um, you know, randomly changed, essentially. And then the model is fit using that subset, and you create um, an estimate of performance, which could be, you know, accuracy, ROC. Um, if 
the previous. So if your if the current iteration is better than the previous, um, then you accept it. Um, so, so is the idea here that the uh, <clears throat> this is like a shortcut to some of the methods that I described last week? Because last week it was like we're just going to try everything and we're going to put everything yeah. together, and so like they were yes. running every model and every iteration, and this one is yes. like, well, we're going to like try and find our way to the right place. Yes, absolutely, you're correct. Okay, cool. You know, in certain situations, it would just take way too long to do these like greedy search methods, right? And so I know with genetic algorithms, it works really, really fast and produces some some results that are um, very close to what you would find in the greedy search methods. So yeah. how, how come how come it doesn't end up because you've mentioned it a couple of times, Ethan, how come yeah. it doesn't end up in a local minima or maxima or wh whichever one we're looking for? Yeah, um, I think so that what I mentioned before about they have like um, this acceptance probability right here. Yeah. And it's it's more complex than what I described. But like there's a threshold that you have to meet that decreases over time. And also, in addition to that, um, part of that threshold is set randomly. So sometimes it'll let um, a solution through and sometimes it won't. And so that that's another way of like, uh, you know, preventing it from being stuck in that local minimum. Okay, cool. And so there's like different situations where, um, you know, maybe you would accept one solution and when you wouldn't. And I believe um, this is kind of a table that describes what is happening. So, um, so here's the iterations. Here's, I believe, the size of, of your predictor space, ROC, which is like the performance um, estimate. And then you have the first thing is your probability of accept. So um, that is calculated and you see how it kind of like, it, it looks but like it, it gets narrower and narrower, although at the very end, and I'll, I'll get back to this, it actually, there's also a point where um, if it doesn't improve, um, it'll restart the whole process using your um, highest performance iteration as the starting point. And so that's why you see how it kind of decreases and then it goes right back up to a high probability again. And so that's another way to kind of get out of um, getting stuck in the local optimum. And then also, um, as I briefly mentioned, there's also this random uniform value that I believe is multiplied with the probability to determine whether that solution is accepted or not. Um, you said you've run these before, right? What's your typical iteration number to get kind of a good response out of the, this type of model? Or, do, so or did I, I misinterpret you? So I've, I've used genetic algorithm. The genetic oh, okay. Algorithm. This Different. is the one I have it run. Although like some of the ideas are very similar. Um, I believe there are, um, I think you can do it with fewer iterations with simulated than annealing than genetic algorithms. And actually okay. um, you brought up, which is the, the part of the next point is that you have to have like a, a robust uh, evaluation criteria for determining the right number of iterations, right? And so they do that by this very complex chart uh, that involves essentially like two levels of cross-validation. Um, so first you have your, your data, you separate it into test and train. The, the test is like totally separate from a cross-validation. And they, they do, um, how should I say this? You take your original, and I could be describing this wrong. Again, it's like, there's like an external cross-validation resample right here. And then you split that again um, to have a training and a test and you perform like an internal cross-validation. And this step is used um, for determining the number of iterations. And then this next step is used for um, guiding the subset of predictors. So this, this probably requires quite a bit of data, right? To be able to make this many splits? Well, I know with um, genetic algorithms, 
generally speaking, you need um, like minimum of of 30 samples. I'm not sure how much data you need for for simulated annealing, to be honest. It's, yeah, but it's, I know that the two of them are used kind of inter interchangeably. Um, it seems like uh, this can be less computationally intense than genetic algorithms. So this might be why some people choose to use it. Um, it's, but I, it's, I don't know what the parameters for that are in terms like the, the range of, of, of data size that is acceptable. I'm not sure. It's yeah. the same tenfold cross-validation as vfold CV gives you. Even if it's the same as tune grid, it's just doing it, it, it explores the parameter space faster, but it's it's the same V folds as before. Okay. Yeah. Just like a, di a different setup, I guess. It's a little bit um, hard to grasp, I think, for self. I'm still um, a little unclear, like the difference between the internal resamples, resampling cross-validation and the external cross-validation. But um, it seems like one of them is used for determining the number of iterations and one of them is used, um, I'm sorry, this is the one used to tune the search iterations. And this one is used for um, determining the subset of predictors. Um, so I think they lay it out here also like very long. <laughs> um, so you've got, First, you create your external resampling method um, where you create an initial random feature subset. Um, for each iteration, you do simulated annealing where you create an internal um, subset within that where you mix up um, the feature space, fit the model, um, and then you make a prediction and use the performance estimate in simulated annealing. And then so based off of that performance and that, um, that uh, what's the word it used? Based off of this random uniform number and the probability, that's how you decide if it's accepted or if you restart um, or if it's rejected. And so you can, I may have like jumped ahead. It looks like there's like an if else here where you calculate the accepted probability um, and you compare it with um, that random uniform variable. Um, okay, so I think this is first the external resample and this describes what happens in the internal resample um, where you're looking specifically at the number of iterations in the internal. Um, so the reason you do the random uniform variable is to just add some random rejection criteria so that you don't, yes. you prevent spurious results or? And the genetic algorithms have something very similar to that, essentially, just a method to prevent you from getting stuck. Yeah. It seems like uh, if, if it happens to be high, you would you would reject well, if it was higher than your previous subset, you would just accept it. But if it it ha it has to be better um, enough, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> it has to have enough of an improvement. Yeah, and also like uh, you know survive this random um, uniform random variable pruning. Yeah. yeah. Which I guess is also like, uh, you know, a decimal. It's in the form of like a probability. So if this is bigger than the probability, then it's rejected. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so these are the results of the tenfold cross-validation. Um, and so you can kind of see here that... Um, they have similar trends per fold, although there are some major differences. You can see that um, you know it peaks around um, 300 iterations. And this is based off of, right, this is the internal resampling method. So we're just looking at um, the number of iterations, like what is the optimal for that? 
And then this is another part that I was a little bit confused about. So you have your internal um, resampling method, and then you have the external sampling method where you're looking at the subsets. And then you compare both of them together and do a rank correlation to see if, um, I guess, it, to see if the number of iterations and um, the number of predictors, um, you know, produce a consistent result. Do, does anybody else see in the blue, especially like a sinusoidal? There kind is. Kind of like, woo, 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 woo. what's with that? So um, I think there's a little explanation um, about that later on. You, you, you oh, want to look, at, I'm, I'm you wanna look at both of them separately, um, but also do the rate correlation to see if it's like a consistent result. And so there's certainly a variability, um, although there is, so this is the rank correlation right here. Um, okay, it looks like the average was 49 to 64 predictors. I believe the initial number was like 112 or something. Um, let's see, so here is, here's that like, that pattern that you were describing, um, Brandon. And um, I can't remember exactly what they said here. So this is um, this is just two ways of looking at it. So this is, I believe this is for, was done inside the external resample. See, if it says inside the external resample, does that mean the internal one? <laughs> it's, 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 it's weird, but... Um, if you want to make a comparison between both of them, you see that um, like around here, you start leveling off. Um, but the best point really seems to be right here, right? Or even like right here, not over here. And that's how you would determine how many iterations you would do. And then, um, yeah, it essentially uses like what area has the best um, ROC curve is used for the final like decision on how many iterations to do. Um, it also talks a little bit about what happens when you use one hot encoding with categorical features. And you can see right here, this looks almost identical to what I already showed you. The difference um, is that you need almost like double the number of iterations um, to, to find a good result. And like, obviously that would increase the computation time. There, it also in, did increase the performance, but it was like 0 0.05, like it wasn't that much. Um, another thing that you can kind of use to see if your predictor space is a good fit or not is to look at um, different sizes of initial subsets. So like you can, that's something that you set. So you say, uh, I want subsets to have, you know, 10% of the predictors in each subset 50 or like 90 percent which you would want like almost all of the predictors to be in each and you can see that um through cross validation most of the time they kind of converge um you know the when you use more predictors the it like converges downward and when you use less it, it goes upward and that's pretty consistent Yeah, so in the end, um, you would probably want to use fewer predictors because it would speed up the process. Because in the end, their ROC curves are actually virtually identical, whether you use 10, 50, or 90%.
And then um, the next chapter which I'm more familiar with is um, uh, the genetic algorithms, which are really, really, really cool. And they're based on, um, or they mimic Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. And um, essentially the way that it works is that you have an initial population. Um, so that would be, um, an, so the way I, I should also back up and say, I use genetic algorithms for multi-objective optimization. So it's like a kind of a different um, format, but it essentially works in the same way. So you have this initial population, which can be, you know, samples, or I think in this case, it would be like a subset of predictors. Your original, um, so you have your original subset of the predictors. And then um, there is some like fitness criteria. So you rank um, each of the samples in your population. And those that have the, the highest performance or fitness criteria um, mate. And so here you, they call it like a chromosomal evaluation, um, but it's essentially like a, a fitness um, evaluation. And those, it could be however number, um, th there's like different criteria for setting that fitness evaluation. And they each have their own like uh, parameters to tune, but essentially those that are in your like fittest pool mate with each other. And that's when crossover happens. So it's exactly like if you want to think of um, your introductory biology course. So the genes or um, the predictors in this case would switch places to create an offspring that has, you know, half of the genes of one parent and half of the other. And that is like, so you got your parents that are the fittest um, subset of predictors, and then they create an offspring where you mix up, uh, when you mix up the predictors again. In addition to that, another way of avoiding getting stuck in a local optimum is mutation. And so, again, this is also exactly how it sounds. You randomly select one of the predictors um, to change. So that ensures that you have like a, a diverse set of samples in subsequent generations. And so um, it goes parent, offspring, and then a new population is created. So that's called like the second, third generation. And the process repeats itself over and over until you've set the maximum number of iterations. Um, so just like simulated annealing, this is something this like maximum number is something that needs to be uh, set and evaluated. They use the same process through cross validation. I guess I should go down to show you kind of how it works. So this um, is the initial population, right? So you have 12 samples with different combinations of predictors. There is um, like some performance criteria, which I believe in this case is, um, what is it? I think it may be accuracy again. And then there's also this probability value, which is based on like the probability of it occurring um, in the data set. Um, so in this way, you don't get, um, this is another way of ensuring you don't get stuck in um, a local optimum, because if there's a solution that you would probably not see, um, or there's a low likelihood of it occurring, it might not make it into like that fittest, fittest population um, criteria that is, that is made in to create the offspring. So, um, you know, higher performance is generally better. But again, there's like a weighted selection probability that ensures that you don't get um, solutions that may not occur. Um, and so this is a breakdown of how the parent offspring and mutation work. So based off that first generation, these are the two fittest samples based on performance and the probability. Um, here's their subset of predictors. So you see one of them has much fewer than the other. 
then they are mated together and this is their two offspring you can set the number of offspring um, that you would like in each generation and um you can see how it's kind of these these this predictor is flipped so it's now included in the top um predictor space you can see that it doesn't change that much um, in this particular case they may have only set the crossover to be like 20 percent, but you can set like what percentage of your predictor space that you would like to cross over and then after crossover that's when mutation kicks in generally this is like a low percentage that you want to change although this is something you can also set so i think they recommended one to two percent chance that a predictor would randomly change so i can't remember so those are both tuning parameters right you would run the model with different mutation rates and different crossover rates to see what would come out okay yeah. there's actually many many different ways you can configure genetic algorithms based on you know like what you're trying to do what are the number of objectives that you're trying to find the optimal for um right you, you use a different genetic algorithm for multi-objective than you would use for a single objective optimization. Um, so here, here's just like um, a breakdown of, of some of the hyperparameters. So you can set what you want the size of each generation or population to be. These are just the, the general defaults, um, crossover um, 80%, which doesn't seem like that's what they use for what's up top um the mutation probability and then this elitism value elitism is when um sounds kind of rude to me yeah <laughs> elitism is when in one generation there's a superior um combination and if you want that to carry over or compare to subsequent generations. So maybe you don't want to compare that. And um, you know, maybe that would help you not get stuck in a local optimum, for example. This is this is a parameter that I had not known about, actually. But it's essentially like keeping the best um combination and like keeping it throughout all of your generations to make comparisons. Um, okay, and then, so you can see here, so here's, uh, I believe this is through, okay, I think this is based on cross-validation. Um, so iterations would be generations, and this is showing you that the subset size of your predictor space is, is converging. It looks right here that it hasn't really converged yet, maybe. So you would probably want to increase the number of generations. Um, mean similarity is when you're comparing um, how similar the fittest combination of predictors are to each other. So you can see generally that they become more similar across um, the cross-validated samples. And you also see that over time, um, the ROC curve, um, more area is, in, is, is, um, is under the curve, which is exactly what you want. Um, and this is the same thing. Instead of using cross-validation, we're using like the entire um, training data set. So the subset size decreases, um, sub subsequent generations, they become more and more similar to each other. So this is kind of where you get into the overfitting. So you want to be really careful um, that you don't do too many um, generations because you want your solutions to be diverse enough. Otherwise, you could um, maybe not map out um, your prediction spaces as well as you would like. Um, and the ROC curve also, as you've seen up here, it um, more areas under the curve. Um, one of the downsides to this method over um, simulated annealing is that without any sort of penalty, 
you could include many more predictors. So you have to kind of coerce it um, to have a preference for solutions that are more sparse. So that's why it's calling it um, like co coercing sparsity. Um, and to do that, it essentially becomes a multi-objective problem where you are trying to optimize um, the performance, but also you know, decrease the number of predictors. And you can use a number of different um, functions to do that. For this particular case, they use, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, just say AIC, they use the, the information criterion to, that gives a penalty on the number of predictors in your set size. And so another thing you do, so you take your performance criteria and you take your, um, your, your penalty and you create this multi-parameter optimization space. You see you're trying to maximize the performance, but also minimize the number of, um, of predictors and they're normalized, I believe. Actually, no, this is different. <laughs> I think they're supposed to be normalized. But um, anyways, you take these two together and you create this um, density map of what's called your desirability function. So whether it, it meets those two conditions. So you see that um, over here in this area of the graph, this is probably the, the optimal number of predictors. Um, compared to the ROC. So that's pretty cool. Um, ah, okay. So they spend a lot of time talking about this, this desirability function, which is essentially um, the multi-parameter optimization. Um, so you can see like over time, the desirability of your solutions increases. They become more similar. Um, the ROC kind of converges. So this is where you would want to, you know, uh, set your optimal point and then compare it to the the subset size. And so here is a comparison between um, the constrained model, so the model where you include the penalty for predictors and that without. So you can see that the constrained model um, is a little worse, but it can make up for that with performance increases. Because um, genetic algorithms generally can take a lot more time. And I should also say that there, there was also um, a lot more detail they went in with the cross validation. So just like with simulated annealing, there's this like external resample, internal resample, um, and that can take like hours for genetic algorithms to do. Um, it probably still take a while with simulated annealing as well, but um, you might need a lot of um, computational resources to get this done for something that you need to do quickly. <laughs> So super important to know. Um, so I mean, that's pretty much it. Both of these methods are, are really great ways of um, investigating your predictor space, identifying the best predictors in the you know fastest amount of time. Um, I know for genetic algorithms, there's many packages out there that are really, really easy to use. And so you don't need to necessarily concern yourself with all of the really complicated cross-validation. Um, I haven't seen one for simulated annealing, although I'm sure there is one. Um, yeah, I think the last part, it says that um, one of the good things about evaluating it with cross-validation is that you can use it in parallel. But even doing that, you're still going to look at like perhaps hours of time that it's going to take to compare all of the models. Yeah. So that's about it. That's all I got. Um, really awesome, though. Like the genetic algorithm just like blows my mind how much, you know, 
something like biology could have a huge impact in, in statistics, right? It's really, really cool. And you can use genetic algorithms for a lot of different things, not just um, finding the correct number of, of predictors. Yay, biology. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right now I'm working on a um, particular multi-objective problem. So where you have multiple outputs and one of the genetic algorithms can optimize up to 15 outputs at once, um, which is insane. Good job, Ethan. Ethan. Thank you. I hope that was clear. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Very complicated topic. Yeah. Some, some, something that I want, uh, I would like to, you know, get a little bit clearer is the internal uh, external resampling that uh, they're mentioning. Uh, uh, probably when you see the script, you know, you'll get the idea of what they're, you know, what 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 is that external and internal, uh, you know, resampling. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I'm not sure if they included the code for this, um, but I would imagine so. I think most packages probably do this all internally, but I could uh -huh. be wrong. I definitely could be wrong. Like I know that um, for genetic algorithms, um, this particular package, um, IMO, uh, uh -huh. it gives you like a, a rating after each generation to say like how well it did at making your your population diverse or whether it it converged in like an optimal solution after a certain number of generations right. so i know that there's there's got to be some some packages that have this done internally because it, it definitely sounds like a very complicated process that can be automated <laughs> okay that's great very interesting thank you so I like this to not not to wrap up because um, but to talk about in practice when we do so we do a model uh, analysis of certain kind of data. First thing we we know that it might take time. So before so the the things of trial and error is a bit like. Mm, not something to do. So you, you, you need to, to know what are the parameters that you are going to be, uh, so that, that are going to be needed uh, in your model to, to, to achieve the best performance. And this is quite a challenge. So you, you never know, you, you might not know what's the best uh, procedure for you. So you, um so and um basically when, when we do a model what, what we do is to uh take our data split the data within a test um uh, training and test set and then uh, so th there, there will be some pre-processing first and after the splitting then we do a, apply a first type of model, like a simple one. Just correct me if I'm not. Uh, and then uh, see if the, uh, so um, if we can achieve a better performance with uh, selecting predictors. So we then apply, now I have in mind like study model syntaxes. So we apply like some steps functions to uh, transform the predictors or selecting them with how the step uh, correlation, how do we, because in practice then we have said many things. So now put the, them uh, in practice and uh, you can use many things. What What's the best thing to use for like, uh i i do step core for example and i i set like a, a threshold and it automatically uh, automatically select a certain number of predictors which 
have uh, uh, a lower level of uh, correlation that I've uh, set. And then I have other methods that I can use. Anyone to mention some other methods just to... I mean, to start out, I mean, <clears throat> there was that box Cox transformation to get normality. That seemed really critical, but that might have been before you do your correlation filter? Yeah, okay. I think that's more for like improving the predictive power. The transformation or? Yeah, yeah. I don't think it affects the, the, um, the predictors that you select. Oh, yeah, sorry. I... Okay, uh, we still have 30 minutes and I posted in the, the <clears throat> Slack uh, that I was, you know, doing some experimentation with a technique that Max Kahn, you know, uh, showed in the in the in the POSIT, which is before Studio now POSIT uh, conference, about incorporating the feature selection, okay, process into the pre-processing, okay, of, of of your data. In other words, not take it, you know, externally but internally. So. If you give me one minute, I'm going to, you know, leave this session and log with another computer because this computer was giving me a little bit of problems, uh, you know, to show you, you know, what what he was talking about. Okay, so I'll be I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> so then that because um, my my just quickly and then you 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 do cross validation and. Cross validation is done on the training set, but what if you subset the the number of predictors and make some like uh, feature engineering with a step function, making a uh, then can you do cross validation new on your new set? I, I believe so. So basically, you have a training set. You make pre-processing feature engineering, so reduce the number of predictors, so like making a recipe and then uh, bake and uh, prep and bake. So you have a new set with less number of predictors. Then you can can you make a cross validation on, on it and use that as a new um, it's, it's, I don't know that's what they did. Yeah. In this particular case, but they the, they use the crawl, crawl, cross validation on on different for different things. Okay, uh, I'm back. So let me share my screen. Okay, everybody sees my screen. Yeah. Yep. Is it? Uh, let me change the appearance a little bit. Uh, okay, so you can have a bit more clearly. Can can you oh, see I the think. can you see the yeah. font? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, in that presentation, Max talked about a package called uh, recipe selectors. Okay, uh, which uh, gives us. Uh, some recipes, you know, some steps, uh, commands, you know, involving the recipes so that we can use to not only to, you know, scale the, you know, the, the predictors, uh, you know, do the dummy variables, etc., but also tune uh, the subset of features that are optimal for a certain, a certain metric. Okay. So, I'm going just to, you know, fire this up. Okay, and we're going to load. Uh, remember in chapter the last, uh, the last, the the previous chapter, the Parkinson uh, data set, which has uh, 180 something uh, samples, but 750 uh, predictors, very high dimensional. Okay, I believe Brandon, you know, <laughs> remembers that very well. <laughs> he was the one that presented it. Yeah, okay, yeah, and also apart from the high dimensional, we have another challenge, which is that the the class, 
okay, which is if the person has Parkinson or not, is highly, highly uh, unbalanced, imbalanced, right? So uh, I, I had a little bit of difficulty with uh, some of the predictors that have a very small, you know, variance, okay? So I had to verify that, uh, you know, in this function, it doesn't show, but then when I go to the predictors, uh, you can see in the schema, you can see that the standard deviation of some of these uh, uh, predictors, which are the TQWT mean value, uh, December 1, this, December 2, DEC 2, DEC 1, et cetera, they have a very, very small, small variance. And that was hurting uh, the, the, you know, the processing in the models. So what I did was identify those predictors and then with the recipe, you know, remove them, uh, you know, without removing the, trying to remove with the non-zero variance because it, it wasn't working. So one of the things that we're going to do are going to load also the, the, the Themis library is the one that has the steps for un, unbalanced uh, data. And also there's a step from the RAD package recipe selectors. Uh, there are many. Okay, but one of them that is in one of the tutorials that the package, uh, you know, uh, present us is the step select ROC. In other words, you're going to do, use ROC as the metric to try to define what are the optimum number of predictors within, you know, within the, the recipe. And this is the, the instruction. As you can see, there's a tune parameter here, right? Okay, top predictors equal to tune. So we're going to do a tuning first, and then when we get those top predictors, that number, then we're going to incorporate it again into the recipe. Okay. So let me lo load up the, the, the Themis library for the imbalance. This is the, the step smallest imbalance, right? And then we got the recipe, right? Okay. And we're going to run a simple model. We're going to run the, the like, uh, regression model, a simple model to try to see which is the optimum uh, set of, 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 of features, okay? We're going to do a workflow. We're going to give a P info because we need that for the, for the tuning of the, of the, uh, you know, of, of that parameter. Then we're going to set the seed, do the cross validations because the sample uh, size is very small. I'm only using three, okay? Not the 10, that usually is the the the, the default. Uh, only three, uh, you know, uh, faults, okay? Then we have our control grid and then we fire it up, right? We're going to tune the grid, but the tuning parameter is going to be the, remember, the, the number of predictors here. Okay. There's going to be some messages here that it relates to the convergence, right, of the logistic regression because you need convergence. And it's related to some of the folds. Okay. So some of the folds apparently don't have certain number of, you know, classes that the system, you know, needs, you know, to converge. Okay. So this is phone number two and then phone number three. <clears throat> the model processing music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not sure what genre that would be. Mm. Okay. So now we have our, you know, our results, right? And as you can see, the split number one, the phone number one, it doesn't have, you know, any any information. You know, some of the models, you know, ju just fail. But we can use, sorry. Uh, we can use then the other folds, number two and number three, right? So to give you the uh, the metrics, right? Okay, you can see it right there in the chart. 
uh, you can see that the highest point of this chart, which is the mean of all the, the folds, the highest point is about 11. Excuse me. Uh, it's about 11 predictors, right? Okay, that's the that's the peak of what you know our metric is is giving us, you know, with the mean. So when we show our best, you know, the first one that it has the highest mean of the ROC is has 11 predictors. So that's our 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 number of features that we're going to be using, right? 11. So we're going to extract it, right? Top P, 11. And then we're going to insert it back to our recipe to get that final recipe. That's the one, the final recipe, that's the one that we're going to use then to run uh, all the models that you can you can you can think of. Okay, you can use logistic regression, you can use random forest, etc. But now you know that you have a good set from the logistic regression. You have a good set of how to how to deal with this. Remember, this is a, a set of 150 predictors, right? LM predictors. You know, if it gives you a good you know a good model, it's it's a it's a win. <laughs> okay. So we got here and we chart those uh, predictors, right? So uh, from the recipe, you can prep it, you can bake it, and then extract the names, the column, the name, the column names of the predictors. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's my mom that is calling me. <laughs> okay, so so th these are the these are the the eleven, uh, the eleven one, uh, which should you know. According to this, you know, uh, uh, step select ROC, we should be using. Okay, and then you can then uh, filter, uh, you know, your your train um, uh, uh, data set, and your testing data set uh, with those, you know, uh, with those uh, predictors. Okay, so you are, now you have your train and your set clean and optimized for different models. Then let me see if we have to. Do we have to still time? I don't want to, you know. Two minutes. Really, uh, yeah, how, how many? Minutes. How many minutes do we have? One minute. Two, one, something like that. Okay. <laughs> so this one is uh, using Boruda. Remember Boruda? Uh, you know that that we introduced. It? Well, the recipe selectors has a step Boruda, also. So I said, okay, you know, let's see, you know, what Boruda, you know, can can give us. So I'm just going to run it, you know, pretty fast. You know, I don't want to, you know, uh, pass two. So this is going to be the, the, you know, the recipe for Boruda. As you can see, because Boruda uses random forest, you don't need to scale, normalize the predictors or anything. You don't need that. So you can run your recipe, right? You know, with the with the old predictors. Then you have the recipe. You have your selected predictors. Of course, there's going to be way more than the optimal you know set that that we that, that we had uh so far uh boruda is giving me that the that the 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 class that has the the most predictive power is around two, 204 uh predictors okay then what we can do because you know it's based on a random forest what you can use then uh do a, a sgboost model right uh, you know, to see, you know, more or less, you know, what is the what 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 is the comparison between the logistic regression with eleven and then this one with uh, two or four? Okay, so let's see how fast does it this is this runs. Okay, let's put it in the turbo mode, you know, parallel. Okay. Okay, so right now it's running and it's running the XGBoost based on the Boruda. Okay. <clears throat> a thousand is a lot of trees. I saw you. Uh yeah, but with Zekibus, you know, it's 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 fairly fair fairly uh reasonable. Okay. It handles very well, you know, the 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 that number of trees. If you get five thousand, six thousand, that's a little bit way, way more. <clears throat> okay, so it's it stopped running. Good. 
Okay, so right now we have our three folds. Remember, we're using the same, you know, uh, cross-validation scheme that we use with the receipt regression. And then we can collect the metrics. And as you can see, uh, there's one, okay? You know, some of the sample means, there's one that is, it gives you 0.833, okay? So let's see uh, with this metrics, you know, if we can visualize because SGBoost, remember that it has a lot of parameters that you have to, you know, juggle with. So as we can see, we can see that in some of the areas, we see a convergence within the learning rate, the minimum, you know, uh, num number of predictors, et cetera. So in order to see which are the best, uh, let's, let's, you know, uh, uh, use the command show best. And as you can see, the mean of the cross-validation here with the Boruda, with SGBoost, the highest is 0.833. In the, in the logistic regression, even though it's a simpler model, okay, it's not a very sophisticated model, it gave you, with 11 predictors, it gave 880, okay? So it's, uh, the, the logistic regression is still, you know, a winner in this, you know, in, the, in this test. Of course, uh, we have to see if Boruda is the optimum, you know, a subset because it's 204. We have to experiment with other, you know, with other, uh, uh, you know, uh, methods, right? Uh, you know, to, to get, try, try to get more optimal uh, subsets. Okay, so this is the final. Uh, I'm just going to show you the, the, the variable importance from the XG boost. Okay. Okay, which is the predictor called the standard delta, delta log energy, then the delta, delta, eighth, nine, seventh, and so forth. So as you can see, most of the importance on the SG boost is related to that delta, uh, delta uh, uh, predictor, okay? Then you can do the last fit, you can do predictions and all that. But one of the things that, you know, uh, impressed me was that the logistic regression, just with that step with 11 predictors, gives me a better model than the Boruda and the SGBoos, okay? So sometimes, you know, a simpler model can do a better job than a more complicated model, you know, with more complicated, you know, feature selection, uh, uh, you know, uh, steps, okay? So that's basically, you know, the demo that I, that, that I, that I had for you, you know, try to uh, close that gap that we had in the second chapter. Well, we're talking about, you know, this method now, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, cool. so, well, so we, we all set mm -hmm. to see you for, I don't know, another book club or something else. Sure. Thank you very much for uh, being here. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. So we, so we, meet, we made it. Yep. And um, okay, so this is the, the end of uh, feature engineering and selection. <laughs> um, for the people in the US, you know, a great Thanksgiving. That's coming yeah. next week. <laughs> Thanksgiving. Uh, okay. Bye. Okay, okay, okay guys. <laughs>